learned from him, those who were inspired by him, who saw his meadows. Each one of us, of course, saw just a little slice. Just a little slice. And each one saw a different slice. But that's what you're meant to see. Indeed, often that was what he intended to show. To each one, the slice that he felt that that person needed. And that's the slice that each one of us can hold on to and can use to raise ourselves up. One element of Rav Mendel's greatness was a combination of insight, sensitivity, and understanding, which made him a phenomenal balance. When I came to Osanai 31 years ago, a few months after I came, I joined with Rav Mendel and Rav Yumi Abramov on a trip to South Africa. It was the first time Barsarev had made any incursion into South Africa. We were there for two weeks. In between our various appointments and uh, activities, the Kurdle in Yeovil was the place where we went in to take a few hours to learn. I remember walking in one day with Ravendel. He walked in, took a deep breath. <sighs> Here, I can breathe. Here, it's real. Here, I can be free. Up there is shaken. Shit, lies, tuba. But here, here I can breathe. This wasn't a hatsaga. This wasn't the performance. That's how he felt. He, you could see him straighten up. You could see his shoulders like it. He walked into a local turn. We had a meeting with the Zionist Federation, which made the terrible mistake of sponsoring him of our trip. And one of the tightness that they had against us, and he was our spokesman, of course, was that you are teaching children to break away from their families. You're teaching them to become more observant, not to respect the ways of their parents, and you're breaking up families. You should realize what you're doing to people. Mendel said, let me tell you, you think you're the only one who has that problem? I want you to know that I have a daughter who won't eat in my house. <laughs> so they looked at him, they looked at him, what are you talking about? He said, well, she married a Chazanishnik, <laughs> and she won't eat in my house. I have special, special plates, I have special food for her, and I'm proud of her. I'm proud of her. I have joy from her, simcha from her, because she wants what's good, she wants what's right, she wants what's true. I rejoice in that, that she won't eat in my house. What could they say? <laughs> the rabbi has the same problem. The Zionist... The Federation of South Africa told us, we forbid you to talk about Aliyah. So we said, what? I mean, isn't this the Zionist Federation? Talk about Aliyah? No, you talk about Aliyah, so kids from South Africa will go to Israel, and they may stay there, you're breaking up families. If you talk about Aliyah, we'll lose all our support. So we walked out of the building and talked about Aliyah. We didn't take our marching orders from the Zionist Federation of South Africa. But the, the depth of corruption, the depth of self-deception, self and the Randall listened, and he said, we have our turn, and we have our, our values, and that's what we have to do. Aitza, I've been invited because of my academic credentials to debates in many places, debates with professors of biology, and debates with professors of, of, of Bible, and so forth and so on. I don't go as an individual, I represent our I went to the and I said, what should I do? Should I participate in such a thing or not? He said, absolutely not. Don't take it for anything, because what is the mental set with which people go into debates? Number one, it's let's watch them fight. It'll be very exciting. And they go in, those are passionately convinced that he's right, those are passionately convinced that he's right, no one will change his mind. No one's listening. They want to see, did he get him? Good stuff. You know, did he make him uncomfortable? Did he blink? You know, was, was he concentrated? Was he focused? He said, if you want proof, look at the way the press reports the debates in the presidential election. He looked calm, or he looked nervous, or he was disoriented. They never comment on what he said, his policies, right, wrong. But Mendel said, absolutely not, never do it. And of course, I, I took his ATSA, and I have never done it. Um, but that was his, did he ever engage in a debate, or even witness a debate between a rabbi and somebody else, and that's a, but he knew. He knew and he understood that this would be a self-defeating exercise. <coughs> there is an expression with which we're all familiar. Tvorim hayotzim in a leif, yathosin in a leif. Have to look for it. 
day before yesterday, you won't find it. It's not a chazal anywhere. The Michlol says that the only place he found it is in a sefer by a son of Heaven Ezra. Before that, it doesn't exist. And after that, everybody says it, but it doesn't have the kind of makor that we give it. Okay, my Rebbe Zatzal, the Rebbe said, look, Nevi'im hey, b'nei Nevi'im hey, if Ka Israel accepted, then it's got to be Kodesh. But I want to question what it means. I think that there are two dimensions. One is, if you really believe it, if you really mean it, if it comes out of your life, has a shdocha, a lokis, that a Kodesh Baruch will make it effective. But, if you're speaking to people who you know, or you could know, and you could take them into account, if you could reach out with your life to their life, if you could use what we call a leif mevin, then it will be doubly effective. It's yotzim and our leif. Yotzim and our leif. The leif has to be makusha with the leif of the other person. You have to use your leif to reach out to the other person, not just to speak things that you feel are right. To speak what you feel are right, to be a moment. But mental had both. Number one, as everyone knew, saw him, he lived it. In fact, there's a, an extraordinary feeling that I've had with very few people in life. I'll give you an analogy. Imagine that you are in a certain city and you're looking at a beautiful building. So you call on your phone to someone a thousand miles away and say, I want you to know, I'm looking at this building. It's got doors and marble and has a beautiful roof. You're describing something that you see. Now, the person listening knows you're not making this up. You're not guessing. You're not speculating. You're not theorizing. You're not trying to prove anything. You see it. You see it in front of your eyes. You're telling him what you see. There's a certain reality to that that transcends good arguments, good reasons, good evidence. There are very few people, like my Rebbe Zatzal had it, and Rebbe Mendel had it. When he talked to Torah, he wasn't trying to prove anything. It was right in front of him was right in front of his eyes. He saw it. So he's sharing with you what he could see. But it was absolute reality. That has a tremendous hashpah on people. Akkadekach. Maybe the first few years that I was in our Samaev, we had a boy come in with an earring. It was more popular in those days. There, several months, and then one day he took off the earring. And we were worried. Maybe it was too soon. We never pushed people to cut off their ponytails, to, put, to, to take off earrings. Maybe it was too soon. So we gently inquired as to why it was it took off the earring. The reason was because Rav Mendel spoke about Eved Nirzah. Eved Nirzah. He heard about that halacha and he said, mm. So the earring means I'm a slave. I don't want to be a slave. I took off the earring. Rav Mendel, I don't know whether he knew that this boy was there, that he, or that he had an earring as well. But just speaking of whatever it is, it was enough. And that boy heard it. That's where you have this Me'alateva person speaking, going to the lay, the first of the lay. But Rav Mendel was exquisite with the late making to craft what he said to whatever audience he was speaking to. In Orsa Man, he taught on all the levels. He went on a rotation and taught on all the levels. A man who was safug with Chazal. And who had the Kabul Hashpa from the Gedolei Olam of the previous generation could talk to someone who came in two weeks before from Los Angeles, knowing absolutely nothing, and there was a Keshe. They loved him. They, they drank in his words because he used the lay maybe to say, who are they? Where are they? What do they need? And to find the words and the, and the Hashpa that was necessary for each one. Orami Yotu Nalei, I believe, has these two meanings. Number one, you have to meet him. Number two, you have to use your leg to connect with the leg of the other person. <laughs> and an exquisite example of that.